Welcome to the Growth Zone. I am Christian Bartsch and I have a really interesting session for you today. So I have today with me Veronica Sagastume. She is from St. Carlos, that's near San Francisco. I've got for her three questions and our key topic today is following how accounting, finance and tax professionals can grow during and in particular beyond a recession. Following questions we are going to discuss in our conversation and that is why is it a must for any accountant or service provider to develop a professional and personal brand identity. How can consultants create an irresistible service offer and why is having one so important? Why is creating consultant packages so crucial to building a sustainable business? But before we start, who is actually Veronica? Let me tell you a little bit more about her. Veronica is a business strategist, CFO consultant and all-round powerhouse with a passion for helping corporate accounting professionals start, run and grow their own profitable consulting business. With over 20 years of corporate experience in accounting, finance, operations, Veronica first discovered her love for consulting while working as a CEO at a startup and emerging growth companies in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley. In 2011, Veronica made the bold decision to leave her CFO-COO position to launch her own consulting practice. Fueled by her experience, Veronica skyrocketed her practice to quick success. In 2016, she ventured online to teach other accounting, finance and tax professionals how they, too, could use their expertise to make a greater impact, increase their freedom and enjoy more flexibility while significantly increasing their earning potential. Today, Veronica uses her business, BizFit Coaching Incorporated, to teach aspiring consultants strategies rooted in experience and results. She's an avid learner and loves working out new ideas with her entrepreneurial mentors, including Amy Porterfield, Mary Forleo, James Wetmore, Pat Flynn, and many others. So let's go and have our conversation with Veronica. So I've got with me Veronica Sagastume and uh, she's from a place called St. Carlos just outside of San Francisco or better known in the area of the Silicon Valley. Um, Veronica, would you be so kind and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yes, absolutely. And thank you, Christian, so much for having me on the podcast today. Now, we are going to get into talking about consulting, but before we do that, I do want to share that I do live in Northern California, and I'm always right in the middle between San Francisco and the Silicon Valley, which is where I spent most of my 20-year corporate career, 
back in the day. And then when I started my consulting practice about 10 years ago, I found a lot of my clients still in San Francisco and uh, Menlo Park. So I'm so glad that I stayed right in the middle. I do want to share that I I have a home here in Belmont, California, great oak trees, very, very old oak trees, great weather. And I share my home with my partner of 15 years, Eric Berner, and our dog Coco. So that's a little bit of my personal life. And I know that we're going to get into some juicy, juicy things today. Absolutely. Because when I'm looking at the, the questions that I've got for you and our key topic of how accounting, finance and tax professionals can grow during and beyond the recession that we're experiencing now, and it's going to come ahead of us in the next few mm -hmm. months, um, I think as well that the, the professionals those who are, uh, provide, whether it's a small, medium enterprise or corporates, they have to be uh, ahead of the game and uh, keep their eyes on all different things, not just on what the customers are doing, but what they are doing as well in the business. And for that, Absolutely. I've got three really good questions, and I think that'll be helpful as well for our listeners. And they are following. We start with uh, why is it a must for any accountant or service provider to develop a personal brand identity. Should we get into that right now, Christian, or do you want me Absolutely. to wait? Okay. No, let's go into that. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. This is something that many professionals, whether you're still in the corporate world or starting a business, we don't think too much about it because we're so busy developing the thing that we're going to be delivering, the business. But your personal Your personal brand is not your font or your logo or your color screen. It is your reputation. It is that thing that you're known for. What people say about you when you're not in the room, the way that people talk about you, that the way that they describe you, it is your reputation. And whether we like it or not, we all have one, whether it's in our personal life, in our workplace, or in our business. And so it's really important for us to think about what is the type of business that we want to have in order for them to take some self-assessment of how are we being perceived? What is our reputation? What are we known for among our circle of friends and family? More importantly, in our business, it's our colleagues, our staff, our clients. And so by taking a step back and thinking, doing a self-assessment of what you believe your reputation is, and if you're not quite sure, This is where you can ask some trusted people in your circle of, again, colleagues, friends, family, people that you have either interacted with or have done some sort of work with or for, people who can speak to who you are as a person, as a business owner, your character, your work ethic, all of those things, because your personal brand in your personal life, in your work life, if you're an employee or in your business, it will translate into trust with your clients. And it's also important for us to constantly be growing. We're human, right? So we're constantly developing. And as our, as our, as we grow as a person, so will some characteristics or maybe some are being left behind. So doing an assessment of our personal brand every so often is always a good idea so that we can keep on doing the things that work and maybe adjust or improve upon the things that don't. And I know that for myself, I had an executive coach many, many years ago who went through an exercise where she asked all of my direct reports. At the time, I was a chief operating officer at a financial services company in San Francisco. And while I thought I was doing a great job, I thought it was a good idea for her to get input from all of my direct reports. And the, the feedback was Mostly good, but a little mixed in some areas. And all it did is give me some really valuable information of areas that I could improve on, whether it was a communication or management style. So again, we, we can't be afraid to ask for feedback. The main thing is that we do something about it. And to that, I just want to add that then beyond your reputation of your personal brand, it goes about, it goes into the, what do you want to be known for as the expert that you're that you are. So for example, let's say people give you feedback on your characteristics as a manager or as a business owner or as a, a professional. Okay. Now, what do you want to be known for? That is part of your personal brand as well. You want to make sure that you are being known for an expertise, a specialty, even if it's more than a few areas, because that way you not only have 
something that you stand for, but you become more referable. When you are known for that thing or those few things, people will think of you right away because they're associating the name with the personal brand, with the expertise. So Christian, that's that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Because as well, people do business with each other and uh, you always experience things happening when it goes well everything is nice when it doesn't go really right then uh, there are problems and that's the thing how do you solve the problem either you go into full conflict and uh, argue and do things worse or you find a quick solution that everybody's happy and everybody keeps their face and um, yeah it's a it's a short-term solution with a long-term objective which is absolutely uh, productive yeah. absolutely and you hit you brought something up just now which is when things go wrong Uh, people look for someone to blame. It's just human nature. And so let's just, mm -hmm. you know, not not be that person to blame. Let's see if we can mitigate that and help it along a little bit, a little bit by having a really good personal brand. Exactly. And that's the thing. It depends as well very much when things uh, are not right. And it doesn't even matter if the, the, the person who has the problem has to solve the problem because whether it's his own problem or not, Uh, he's more or less still confronted because it's his client. And uh, for instance, I've had these situations in my own business, whether it was us who apparently had the problem, but uh, we then, okay, thought, okay, we, we do this and this as a quick solution. I just thought about less than a minute and I decided, okay, we do the, this and this, and the client was surprised and happy. Mm. The same thing I had uh, with a uh, an accounting firm who uh, do service for us to do our audits and all the other things. There was an issue where they it didn't they didn't got it in time and it cost us money because we had to pay some fees and some fines but um because it wasn't our fault but nevertheless they decided okay they're not going to charge us for for the work that uh, provided because they saw the long term it was their fault and it wasn't very pleasant but um they rather work with the client as the client grows and that money they'll do double or three times because we'll be of course much more supportive of them and get mm -hmm. them more clients than actually it would have been if they had behaved like the auditing firm that accounting firm that we had before which mm -hmm. did really bad work and when you think of it uh, we already saved at least uh, three quarters of the accounting wow. costs with them and that's excluding their mistake That mm -hmm. they did. But uh, mm -hmm. that's that's the thing. Are you professional enough to think, okay, how can I do this? I've got this awful situation. How can I decide within seconds or minutes what am I going to do? What's the right thing to do? And not Absolutely. what am I entitled? Because Ent too many. Exactly. Especially exactly. when you think of accounting. Too many I, think I of love that. Opinion. Because your accounting firm was thinking just what you said, the value of the long-term relationship and beyond that is the reputation that they will have with you as a client. And that is exactly what we want to, what we want to focus on is the long-term relationship of having your client think of you as a, the person who stepped up, they solved the problem, and there was a really good solution of not charging you for fixing the mistake. Amazing. What, what a great relationship that you're going to have with them long-term. Exactly. And I got them as well already, another client, uh, uh, even larger company, which is actually funny enough in the same road where they are, but they didn't know <laughs> of each other because, of course, they don't usually in that area walk around and look who, mm -hmm. who's there or whatever. Um, and so they liked it, of course, because I told them, yeah, we use this in this system as well to do all the pre-accounting and so on, which saves mm -hmm. us. 75% of costs and the Amazing. auditing firm that we, an accounting firm that we had before, mm -hmm. they they just overcharged us. And when we migrated to them, even then we thought, wow, that's crazy. We must have years, we must have overpaid for badly organized services. Mm -hmm. And you think of it, yeah, it, what's not just what's in for me as a client, what's in for them, but as well as proactive, how can we be more efficient and focus on what really is value it's not that accounting itself it's advice uh, mm -hmm. the special knowledge that they've got and or the help that you can provide as an expert just to solve problems and that gets me to uh, actually my my second question that i've got for you that is how can consultants create an irresistible service offer and why it is so important having one 
I love this question so much because oftentimes, especially for those uh, new consultants who are just starting out, they may feel the urge to say yes to everyone or, or do uh, perform a service for anyone on anything, even remotely related to what it is that they do. And so I'd like to focus the, the irresistible offer. What, what is it supposed to do? It's supposed to move a person into taking action to buy your thing or to invest in your service. And no, I'm not talking about creating an irresistible offer where you're giving away all this value and you would then discount or devalue your offer. That is absolutely not what I'm going to be uh, talking about or referring to. But I want to say that an irresistible offer, yes, it communicates the value of your offer. It highlights the transformation, the result, the benefit of working with you and investing in your service. But of course, there are some core pillars that go into creating this offer. And, and that's just kind of what I want to touch on right now. But because one of them, one of the core pillars to creating an irresistible offer is that it must be an offer that is sustainable for your business model and that you can continually sell. And this, it, it may seem like, oh, what does that mean? It means that you want to be able to create something that you can systematize or automate. And what I'm, I'm going to give you an example of what that means. It could be that you're creating a workshop, an on-demand workshop that people can uh, purchase and watch at any time. So in the back end, what you want to do is you create it once and then you set up the back system so that you can promote, sell, and deliver that workshop or masterclass. We know we use those two terms here in the US and sell it over and over again. But maybe included in that offer and what makes it a little bit more irresistible is that you are also going to offer a monthly, let's say, Zoom call where you will answer questions live and people can have access to you during that one monthly call. So now you have made an offer where people can purchase that masterclass or workshop. You have systematized it in the back end. And now you're offering access to you, which is so irresistible because a lot of times people don't have access to the person that's created that digital course or the digital uh, program or masterclass that is being delivered. Another core pillar is that your offer is about making the customer or your client feel like that they're getting maximum value for their dollar. And that, that really comes back to when you communicate what your offer can do for them, how it can help them, they'll feel like they just can't pass it up, which is why we have to become so much better at marketing the services that we are going to be delivering, not the logistics of when they're going to get to sign up, when they'll get the masterclass, but rather what they will get if they go through it or what they, where they will be stuck or still you know, in the past if they don't take action. Um, there are two ways that I found to be really effective and profitable in some of these uh, irresistible offers. And one of them is by bundling items or by bundling services. So for example, what I mean by this is going back to the workshop example, you could deliver the workshop with an added bundle of templates to use after which would cost time and money for that person to make themselves. So they invest in the workshop, but as an added bonus, they're getting this bundle of templates that is relevant to the topic that has a perceived value. So right away, the, the person who's buying your service or your offer is feeling that they're getting a much bigger bang for their buck, so to speak. And the second way that I found to be um, a very effective way and profitable way for these irresistible offers is what we call a value add, meaning that the value add is an offer model that is, is a great way to continue to charge full price for your service, but you sweeten your normal offer by throwing them something in with the with this sale. It's very similar to the bundling model, but the perceived value is so much higher. So for example, when I offered a group program in the past, um, or even a group workshop, if it was an in-person, I'll incentivize those fast action takers by throwing in a more personalized exclusive offer, such as a direct review of you know their accounts or their business model or their budget. And I provide them with feedback as well as even maybe what I offer is a smaller group of people to have a hot seat where they can get direct access to me, my expertise, and get direct 
feedback to their business. And do you see, Christian, how much more of a value added benefit that would be to making a service offer of, let's say, whether it's a uh, they they're thinking they're buying a ticket or a seat to a workshop, but they're getting all this other extra valuable input for their for their business. So I just think an irresistible offer should communicate the value of your product or your service so clearly that anyone in your industry or in your market who's considering making that purchase believes that the value will far surpass the cost. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Uh, because as well, when you think of it, uh, accounting service and so on, it, it includes now, there's not just the normal regular accounting, it includes, of course, as well, um, salary, employee accounting, all those things, right. that salaries that are paid and that. And when you think of it, uh, that's an opportunity even where people even can start adding uh, extra little helpful t templates like, for instance, these questionnaires that you have when you are signing on a new employee, oh, you need these yes, bank onboarding. accounts, tax <laughs> numbers. The mm -hmm. simplest thing that maybe 20, 30 years nobody thought and asked every time from you, mm -hmm. and nowadays you send it out to the to the new employee ahead of time and they fill mm -hmm. everything out, they send it in. And before they even per the person even arrives at the office, the accountant has everything done and they just need to sign whatever other documents and that's it. And their onboarding is much, much faster. Exactly. And then they notice, wow, and it's updated um, by the, the service provider. Gives so much extra value whether the customers they don't really have to put the pain and think, oh, have we forgotten something? Exactly. Instead of we add the thing. Because it's that peace of new. mind. Right. It's yeah. that peace of mind, Christian. Yeah, exactly. I, and I love that. I think as a, uh, when we're selling our services or a service offering, it is so important that we do it with confidence and that we come constantly communicate the added benefit because sometimes people need to be told what it's in it, what's in it for them, because it may not be so obvious. They not, we're not able to translate. What does that piece of paper, what is that intake form? What do those templates translate into? It's not just another form. It's that it's done correctly, efficiently, timely, thoroughly, and that it's done for you. It's, it's just, again, the peace of mind is so valuable, but it, I think as service providers, we sometimes need to remind our clients that all that it brings, it's not just a form or a template. Exactly. And even introducing to the clients uh, systems that maybe can even help solve the typical problems of accounting, where the one side sends documents and the other side has to handle it, but it's in the wrong format or they can't mm -hmm. find the payments and they have to connect it, which can be quite a hassle. Um, and that's the nice advantage if then you maybe you know a system that's really helpful to mm -hmm. reduce that kind of issue. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, there are some companies that maybe send in a box full of documents and others send mm -hmm. in emails or documents or upload the stuff and it's a chaos or uh, numbers and, and the things. How do I handle when I can't find the stuff? And, oh, and the exactly. accountant who's far away, they just can't go around the corner to the other office and ask them, well, what's this? Mm -hmm. I've got this paper. What what?" What is this? I don't understand it. I don't. I can't book it in the right ledger if I don't mm -hmm. know what it is. I don't understand this thing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I think just that way you just said. You know, uh, the the key of our our podcast conversation today is about the, how accounting, finance, and tax professionals can grow during and beyond the recession. It is by by providing so much more value and and peace of mind and just that whole hand holding of our clients that will make us just indispensable and. Again, they'll they'll think of us as their partner as opposed to yet another firm that they just hired. Exactly, and it and it doesn't necessarily mean that the the tax accountant is going to make less money because maybe they've put some system in front of them that's maybe helping the processing. I think one of the key things, and I see it was with, with our business as well, it's on both sides less aggravation because I, for instance, used to get like uh, at the beginning many years ago, I used to get like. Uh, I think 18 pages of Excel mm. with all different mm. invoices and payments. So they couldn't figure it out. And I thought, hey, we're paying them for do that. I'm not. It's not my job, and I'm not going to give it to somebody else to do it. I, I hate this. And, mm -hmm. I, and so there was a point where I was really getting really, really angry mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. really frustrated. And now with the new system, I know, okay, we might have one or two things that maybe are uh, uh, problematic, but uh, I don't get Excel sheets anymore. And that's mm -hmm. a nice thing because on both sides, the stress level is down 
while the other accountant with his old style is everybody more or less, I think they, they must be getting sick now with all the garbage that they're producing. Mm -hmm. And our side now with the new team, it's, it's awesome because both sides are happy. We're not being furious at each other when we actually, mm -hmm. when, when we send emails or anything, it's always friendly. We, we haven't got to think, oh yeah, be ahead of time because the person is going on holiday. Yeah, no problem. It doesn't make any issues for us. Exactly. Or, or for instance, I, I, I recently I uh, doubled the salary of one employee, and I said, uh, "Can we double it as well for the months before?" And can we do it? Others would just go, "Oh, it's too complicated, and we have to this." No problem. Yeah. Can, can we do it at the end of the month? So we do it all in one go. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> the employee was happy because he got like a triple what, salary then. And, what a great customer uh, experience. Yeah, absolutely. Because. Because as well, at the other side, it's not just me as the customer, the guy who then says, okay, I'm going to, uh, I've got this thing I want to sell. The employee at the other end, he's waiting for the extra bonus and he's actually mm -hmm. jumping around thrilled that he's being, uh, uh, he's being uh, promoted on that, which is, of course, from very thing. But if it works so easy and painless mm -hmm. and he doesn't to ask, ah, but my, what about my salary increase and so on? No, everything is fixed, works, and he's happy and is uh, like in heaven. And that's the <laughs> nice thing. Because Absolutely. It's, well, it, it's just about not only regular tax, it's about the, the, the employment stuff and these things. So when you, oh, yeah. you've got things like, for instance, now with all the COVID stuff, Mm -hmm. That creates havoc. I don't know how it's at the moment in the U.S. going, but for instance, here they recently decided to reduce uh, the sales tax, mm. and it's just and it decided like one one week, and everybody thinks, oh, uh, how am I supposed to do this in the, in my software? And the next one thinks, okay, but if I deliver in this time, do I have to charge a low one or the high one, or do I have already have to? We're getting now invoices that are practically so split that even the systems can't cope where it costs us more time and energy than it's actually uh, worth the client. Worth, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's, yeah. it's, it's, uh, this pandemic has definitely created a different, uh, I'm going to say chaos in how we deliver and what we're supposed to do because we're being given guidelines, different guidelines almost on a weekly, monthly basis right now. So I, I hear you. It's And what our job as a service provider is for our clients is to keep them informed and also to make that inter, inter, interaction seamless or more pleasant. And I think as a client, you need to feel confident that your service provider, your accounting firm or what, whoever else you're working with, whether it's a law firm, that you are being taken care of, that you're in good hands, they're on top of the information, and that you're going to be given really clear guidelines so that you can have that. Again, we go back to peace of mind, so you you're, you know you're in good hands. Absolutely. And, and speaking of finance, there are so many professionals that, to, uh, for instance, um, work as well with, with all these subsidies and so on that help mm -hmm. companies to get subsidies. That's as well quite a complicated work that takes maybe months or or, or years to get everything properly, the all the documentation, so that not only get the money, but they can keep the money and invest mm -hmm. it into new technology and creating new jobs. But if there's not a professional really does it in a professional way, it's just a pain in the neck for, for companies if they want to innovate. Exactly. And that's the thing. They eventually move there where it's easiest and they say, okay, if it doesn't work here, we go somewhere else, we do it there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, and I think they're looking just, for the seamless. They're looking for the seamless experience, for the good experience, where you're not going to dread seeing their email in your inbox. <laughs> so. Exactly, exactly. On both sides, they dread it, then and say, "Oh, not again, this guy. Oh, <laughs> no, again, another problem." Because the other questions, and I get from the authorities this stupid form that we're supposed to fill out, <laughs> and ah, I don't understand half of it. Send it. Oh, I can't read it half of it. Yeah, great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You want and to create nowadays, the opposite. You want to create the opposite feeling like, oh, I wonder what he wants this time because, you know, last time was so easy. I'm sure yeah. this time will be easy as well. Exactly, exactly. And that's the same with, with the new uh, new people that we've got. We had like an audit for for uh, the pensions, mm -hmm. uh, the tax, uh, the government pensions. And usually this is a pain in the neck, this stuff. We had, I think, one form we answered delivered all the information necessary then was oh the data is still as well the old years is relevant uh, still in the data of the old tax accountant who was rather, rather i wouldn't say silly but uh, he was more like a nightmare 
<laughs> and he claimed oh, no. he had passed everything on. Oh, no. But uh, uh, then we eventually went through other uh, ways to get all the data out. But it's, it's crazy. But it was easy. On the other hand, the new team was value-driven. They weren't thinking on, oh, we're entitled, we're overcharging this stuff because it's garbage or anything. Mm -hmm. It just went and did a professional mindset. Let's get this done quickly and properly. And yeah, of course, we had to pay something for the for the extra work, which wasn't planned, but at least uh, it didn't cost us like a fortune wasting on something that isn't providing value. Because I exactly. think that's as well one of the, the things when you look as a customer mm -hmm. on anything that's accounting, finance, tax and that, and you're getting the invoices from professionals and think, that's not gen what am I supposed to do that? That's not generating any sales. That's not mm -hmm. getting any leads. That's not mm -hmm. reducing the costs of my products or my sales. Uh, I'm not reducing uh, travel costs and so on. I'm not getting um, greater reach. It's paperwork that mm -hmm. has no value. And that's, I think, if the other one is able to really give you good value, you're willing to give the money because, okay, okay I can't avoid it. But at yes. least I'm getting something for the money. Exactly. So what you just said is so key because that's just it. You see the value. When you see that that accounting firm is value driven, which means that maybe they're not adding to your bottom line in terms of sales, but they're maybe giving you enough advice and guidance as to how to take a credit or tax savings or better prepare or better manage or better opportunities. And so your experience with that type of firm, you not, you don't see it as, oh my God, it's an expense and it's draining my business account. You see it as they're giving me great guidance, great value because they care about me. They care about my business. A very different relationship with that firm than the other. Absolutely. And that's why as well, I see it's so important when I look at the, the third question I've got for you. And that is why is creating consultant packages so crucial to building a sustainable business? This is an area where I think so many consultants also, or consulting firms, um, I say both because you could be an independent consultant and make the same mistake as a consulting firm of not setting good and clear boundaries. And what I mean by this is the, you know, having a process, the systems that you use, the clients you want to work with and that you want to, you want to attract and work with and that you're excited to work with and know the solution that you will provide for them is so important because when you get clear on the services you offer, the systems that you use to deliver that offer, the clients that you want to work with, even setting your work hours, the response time, being disciplined about all of this communication with your clients will help to create a consulting business that you'll love. We've all been uh, I know that for me, I made it this mistake where early on, I wanted to please my clients so badly that I would make myself available 24-7. And what I created was a very unsustainable workload because the if I received a message, a text, an email of uh, or, or a phone call on a Sunday at six o'clock in the evening, I would take it. What I taught my clients to do is that they could reach me anytime in anywhere, anyhow, I I did not send good boundaries in the beginning. And so not only that, but I did not create good boundaries in terms of the systems that are like, for example, let's stay with accounting, the accounting system that we would um, maintain all of our client records in, or the tax software that we would use to prepare the tax returns, anything like that. If you do not uh, have like systems that you use you, you dilute your, your productivity. And when you dilute your productivity, you no longer have a scalable consulting firm or a consulting business. And what I mean by that is, you know, when um, I want to give an example, it's like, let's say I'm going to, we're going to get off the accounting topic for a moment, but I want to give the example of, let's say you build a website on, you will, your business is to build websites on WordPress. And this is your zone of genius. You're an expert and you can do this things quickly and know that they work because you basically know it like the back of your hand. This is what you do. This is what you deliver. You build websites. We even say, okay, we build websites for accountants in WordPress and that's what you do. But you have a prospect that comes along and says, hey, I would like my website to be built on Squarespace. It's a totally different platform than what you use. But, you know, and it's not what you love to do. And it's not the core service offer that you that you deliver. But you know you can do it and agree to do it. However, now 
now you're not as familiar with this uh, with this platform, so you're not as familiar with the newest features that it has. It takes you time to get up to speed, to try new things, to test it, and then end up spending a lot more time on this project than normal because of all the extra steps that you had to take. Now, this is where consultants get into trouble because by saying yes to all the things that come our way, we end up building an unsustainable business because we want a business that we can systematize, that we can scale we need to create standard operating procedures to deliver the work that we want by using standard, like the same systems. We have a blueprint, we have a framework, we're the experts. And so creating a service offer where you outline the tasks you'll perform, the systems that you'll use, the way you'll communicate and deliver the services is something that you will be able to scale because then you'll be able to train others. That's- yes, and that's definitely um, the case because in many areas of business, the people just dilute this stuff. They're working crazy hours uh, mm-hmm. for the clients instead of actually taking the time back and to, uh, even if they're working, investing the time and say, okay, this and this time I um, shut. But then that time I invest in educating myself, learning new skills, updating my knowledge. And yeah, and even somebody's in accounting or a coach or whatever kind of, they have to educate themselves, whether they're reading a book or they're doing an online course or they're going to a masterclass or any kind of things, or, or even just going to, a, to a, a, a exhibition or anything just to find out what's new or exchange ideas with other professionals and that. You need to have the time to actually cut out and do that instead of just running around like a crazy mouse Mm -hmm. and just uh, going in circles because eventually it'll burn you and destroy your total energy. It doesn't mean that you have like the whole weekend and don't do anything. Right. Uh, Like for instance, my my Sunday I was reading uh, a book um, that I just on that day just started reading about business and had, uh, I think I read in the end, like nearly 60 pages and it's really good before that i had finished another one that i finished in the morning so so i in fact i finished one business book and started already next one but in between i had family time we Mm -hmm. did barbecue and other kind of stuff so (laughs) it It wasn't that i was just yeah yeah but at the same time having the mix of family and the mix of re-education in the same time we we show as well our children, we saw, show our employees and, and service partners and so on how to do it properly instead exactly. of showing them back ex- example because we are messing with our own lives and, and not exactly. doing it properly. It's not we about don't being lazy. Pass- no, being focused. it's just it's about being focused and setting those very clear boundaries because we don't want to fall into those bad habits. Those bad habits will lead us to build a business that we don't love. It's building a business that we can't sustain, we can't support, support we can't scale, and it's going to that's how we build a business that we don't love and we ultimately if we're going to do that, we might as well stay working somewhere else and because we're, we're going to be adhering to somebody somebody else is dictating those boundaries for us if we're not clear about them ourselves and really become disciplined about holding them those bad habits can lead us into into some trouble trouble waters so let's be aware of them and stay clear of them exactly because when you look at other areas for instance aviation or so you've got all the pilots have all the checklists what they do between and there's mm-hmm. even one checklist that they have to go and see well am i capable of flying today am i mm-hmm. focused am i maybe aggravated i'm angry maybe about my neighbor because he he made a whole dinner and i couldn't sleep and i'm so <laughs> tired i'm annoyed and and maybe i'm not even feeling well because I ate something in the evening before which wasn't so mm-hmm, good or mm-hmm, well, maybe mm-hmm. I ate too much and I'm feeling a little <laughs> bit, Ugh, that's that's not good. Am I safe to do a, like a four-hour or, or nine-hour flight? Or yes. should I rather say, no, it's not safe? Because it's not just about your own life, it's about the mm-hmm. other people who you've got. Mm-hmm. Or even if you're mm-hmm. flying on your own, your plane can fall on some, something and kill or injure other people and that you don't some want. Some serious consequences there. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And when and in accounting, finance, and taxes, the same thing. Let's say you're doing uh, you're doing the balance sheets for for a company. It's, you're already anyway backlogged in time, and you're trying to do everything at the same time, mm-hmm. and you start making mistakes because you're overtired. Absolutely. You're doing crazy Too stuff. Much. You're not focused. Mm-hmm. Doing twenty t- things at a time. Multitasking is good, but there's a level 
of uh, limit what you can really do mm -hmm. and you have to at least eat something properly and, and have <laughs> even even if it's a 10 minute break and say okay i i, yeah. I just have a quiet lie down or, or just go for a walk which is even better and, oh and yes you reset get, you know, mm -hmm. reset fresh air mm -hmm. and move for instance i've got here for me for instance as well recently i got a rising desk which is awesome because i just press oh, a button it goes that. up and down mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's such an improvement. And then when you think, okay, what can I improve? It's even things like getting a new desk chair. That is mm -hmm. as well uh, much better. And that that's just the small things. And when you think, okay, what but else they can matter. you do? Soft Christian, enough. they matter. Exactly. I have a stand up desk as well, and it's just knowing mm -hmm. that oh, I can move around and circulate and. The, the having being comfortable so you can actually do the work that absolutely matters, and it shows. It'll show mm -hmm. in your work. Yeah, because the first time I saw actually rising desk in a, in a business environment was when I was, uh, we were once just, uh, looking for a new location for one of our companies and uh, we were looking at different properties and we went into one business that was uh, just the next door, which had this other opposite side of the space. And there were, there was a Danish startup and they were standing there with these rising desks and having a conversation, three of these guys on one, uh, one engineering system. And they were looking into the screens and I thought, oh, they're actually <laughs> very unusual, especially when mm -hmm. you come from, from corporate and other areas. You're not really used to that because corporates don't usually invest that much in, in desks. Mm -hmm. The thing is, it, it's, it's just a cost thing. It has to be cheap and it can be used for 30 years, even if it's ergonomically the worst thing. And it mm -hmm. <laughs> costs you more because you get more sick days. Uh, where you have to pay the, the salary, you don't want that, yes. or they, they don't yeah. work, and you have to pay a fine to your customer because in the contract it says if you deliver five days late, you have to pay a lot of fines. Oh my goodness. It's maybe cheap yes. to get a rising desk. It's <laughs> not that much. It's maybe $600 or so. And yeah. It's, yeah. The it's lifetime value. It's it's yeah. a good return on the lifetime of that, of that rising desk because it can be used by others, but also it's just going to be a much more pleasant and beneficial thing for your employees to use so yeah exactly. i agree and, uh, yeah and they are come in different sizes i've got for instance here two two screens on the desk with all my different equipment i've got mm -hmm. and you can use it for anything whether it's for your private time or for for work or even if mm -hmm. uh, it's for the kids or anything that are studying for university or anything even for them it's good even if they're younger it's much mm -hmm. better than just messing their bodies already with sitting too long in the wrong position exactly. and get wrong habits exactly. and the same thing as well with employees you can even expand their work lifetime by actually keeping them healthier with that and it's it costs you less than it will cost you if you don't do that and that's a, i think the long-term thing because it motivates and shows them that you even if you are a service provider um, from outside you value your employees as well as much as you mm -hmm. value your clients and exactly. because you do that your employees will take even better care of your customers which in the end is a bigger return and that's really one of the things that I see because when I look at what we've already been um, been told by you with all the things like uh, the value-driven and, and the packages as well, so important, and combine that with personal brand and the reputation, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's something really, really improving and, and supportive because the clients can really trust you and they have the trust in telling others that you're good. And not, the word of mouth not referral is one of the best kind of business uh, tools out there, right? Because you, even you were just saying how you refer your new accounting mm. firm to others. It's the same way. You're not going to refer the other one. They lost your business just by not being focused on the right side of the relationship. So Exactly. Yeah. Because as well in, in business, that's my experience as well. If I uh, refer somebody an accounting firm or service company, the other, the other person, whether they are a purchasing person from purchasing department or the CEO or the founder, they ask him, me, of course, um, do you use them? Mm -hmm. I can't go and, and say, hey, uh, you must go at this company, super, and then, uh, well, but, but I don't use them. I've never mm -hmm. used them. Uh, <laughs> then how do you know if they're good? Mm -hmm. But if I experience and I know, and I'm, I'm absolutely passionate about that because I know what they can do and what they can achieve, exactly, that's a big game changer. Um, and, and right there, it's a full circle. When you are referring that that 
that firm to someone that you know, you are basing that based on the reputation that they have, the relationship that they have with you based on, you know, being consistent in how they deliver their service. So yeah, going back to that, you know, just it's, it's a full circle moment in terms of your personal brand. So that firm has done a great job by your, with your company. Yes, definitely. And that's uh, the nice thing because you see as well then how you can do it and you can as well tell others, hey, mm-hmm. do it this in this way and, and we'll be as well able to work with you. Even if we are you now maybe doing business with somebody abroad, whether it's in Canada or in USA, we we will have the same standards. We will say we want to have a system that does this and this and we want you to do the services this and this way. If you can't deliver, sorry, it makes no sense to proceed. Exactly. And ask with the other one. The other one told us, yeah, we'll get reports and these things and uh, weekly reports and everything. And we can see all the data. There were no data, no reports. And then uh. there was part of the data was garbage. And then we said, okay, next time we hold them accountable because we've got a mm-hmm. system in front that tells us mm-hmm. if they're doing the things properly. And that's an interesting thing, uh, how some businesses will try to keep their providers as well accountable. Exactly. Well, and they they lost credibility with you the moment that they they overpromised and underdeliver, and when they underdelivered, mm. they lost their credibility with you. You the trust was gone because you saw, oh, they told us they would do this, but their actions did something differently. Too bad. Yeah, and that's and that's the same thing you see in finance, whether it's a bank or a service provider that helps to get finance and other things. If mm-hmm. the if the company as well is capable of of offering you the right kind of advice and support, or when you need something, they say no problem, we get it solved and get it done at once. Then you notice, okay, I'm with the right bank or, or right service provider, and you then as well uh, refer them as well. So it's not just about the company firm or the tax professional helps you save tax or whatever, but it's uh, all these professional areas mm-hmm. that have somehow a consistent uh, connection with money. Mm-hmm. They have an important thing because even if it's if you're professional that goes and advises a company how to improve their internal handling of money even or, oh, yeah. or avoiding fraud or other things or exactly. even how to uh, it falls to avoid even, the mistakes yeah. to avoid yeah yeah even saving trouble. costs when purchasing mm-hmm. it's as well a thing mm-hmm. yeah how do i get pay my suppliers in abroad where usually i pay maybe 20 uh, percent of the tra- of the transaction maybe i just bank fees it's a different mm-hmm. way how can i make it safe how can i mm-hmm. Avoid having these co- uh, compliance issues because maybe the the RLS goes and says, well, but we have no proof that this is a real business or is this maybe a tax avoidance scheme that you send the money there and the money then eventually lands on Bahamas and eventually <laughs> somebody uh, or Copacabana is enjoying a, a piña colada that doesn't, doesn't really work. And they're thinking, hmm, what exactly. are you getting for the money? Yes, yes, yes. No, it's like that. That's going to be a totally different podcast topic, you know, the <laughs> how to yeah. stay out of trouble. Absolutely. Exactly. That's the thing, right? It's the thing. You, the the service professional in accounting, finance, and tax, they, they can have all these things inside because they hear, oh, we're going to do business with that. Oh, wait a minute, but I've got something info for you where you can maybe update your information and you can maybe take into consideration. Even if it's a, a, just a one-pager with things to think, they would say, oh, okay, oh, we should consider that. Um, and then they come back to you and ask, Hey, okay, what do we have to ask from this company in, mm-hmm. let's say, Bangladesh or in mm-hmm. India or in Hong Kong so that we are compliant in case there's some issue or some question that maybe right. some tax authorities. Right. Preparing yeah. for that, preparing for Absolutely. the event before it actually happens. It's so key. Exactly. And when you think of it nowadays, when all these things are where you work with other companies abroad, and then maybe there's some kind of issue where you are not supposed to purchase certain things or not supposed to mm-hmm. uh, make payments in certain countries or that, or, mm-hmm. or companies that are maybe related to certain things that can cause that you maybe lose government contracts or you can't apply oh, yeah. to get a government contract. That can cost a, a, a company a lot of money. Exactly. Mm. Very painful yeah. learning lesson. Costly. Exactly, and that's costly and painful. Yeah, exactly, and all these cross taxes and uh, whether it's inside USA, different 
taxing systems. Every state has a different uh, sales tax. And in Europe, it's the same thing. You've got different sales taxes that you have to register, that you don't have to register. And this is this tax. And I, what, what, what am I supposed it to do? It goes on. <laughs> it goes on. Yeah. Absolutely. But it's a, it's a great thing to, to take the time and think about that as well, how to really be able to provide a better service. Mm -hmm. um, because I think as well, especially whether it's small, medium, or even large companies, they all need financial expertise Absolutely. from outside. And if it's good quality value, they'll use them more and more and as well refer them to small and big clients because you never know who knows who. It, I, I say that all the time, Christian. It's like, you don't know who knows that other person and where that, that's why you have to have uh, your eye on the relationship, not just like, what are you going to do for me right now? You're not the right client, but you don't know if that potential prospect can introduce you to somebody else and somebody else. So you have to make sure that you treat people right and keep your eye on the relationships, not just the dollars. Absolutely. So it was great having you here on the show. And I think we've had quite good insights and all these things, how accounting, finance and tax professionals can grow during and beyond recession, because uh, we never know how long this whole thing uh, continues. But I think the key thing is being ahead of the game and being proactive and not just waiting and hoping for something to happen. Exactly. It's it's one of it's been a great you know I love talking about all of these things because right now I'm I'm on such a mission to help those corporate accounting professionals to monetize their experience, their knowledge, their skill set to start their own profitable consulting businesses. And I hope that today's conversation helped them to see how they could already start preparing or doing some of the things so that they can hit the ground running and not just rely on having a job but possibly starting their own business on the side until they can scale it. So it's been great to be being here, Christian. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, that's all for today's episode of The Growth Zone. Thank you for listening. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify so you never miss an episode. Plus, if you haven't got your signed copy of the marketing book, stop by on our website at book.prmediareach.com and hurry because the reserve batch of signed books are almost sold out. So, the address is bookprmediareach.com I'll repeat, book.prmediareach.com <laughs>